before we begin uh, this morning, I wanted to just, I wanted to say how much uh, I am grateful for you. And I'm thinking about this morning and how many of you are here and we're gathered in this room together. And uh, it's not lost on me that just a few weeks ago even, that this room was sparsely populated with people and we were meeting in two services and even a month or two before that, we weren't even meeting in here. Um, I'm grateful for you and for your faithfulness and that as we gather together again, um, faithfully doing that, that we provide a place for people who are asking serious questions right now, that they come and they see you here and it's an encouragement to them. So I'm grateful for you. This morning, um, we are continuing on with our series, uh, getting back, getting close to Jesus, talking with him, or listening to him, I should say. Uh, this morning, we'll be talking about discipleship. And think about this question of what do we mean when we say disciple? You know, who is a disciple? How do they act and what do they do? How do you know when you're a disciple? No doubt, some of you have asked similar questions. Maybe you've asked, you know, what is a disciple? And is it a special category of extra devoted Christian? Uh, as a believer, do I need to be a disciple? And if, if, I do, if I do want to be a disciple, how do I do it? How do I become one? Now, these are all questions. These are important questions. So let's look at God's word and see what he has to say this morning um, and see what we can learn. If you would pray with me before we read it, and then uh, we'll read it together. Uh, Father in heaven, Lord, again, I give you thanks for this church family, for my church family. I'm grateful for their faithfulness, and Lord, I am grateful for your word. I pray that you would speak to us today, that your spirit would help us, that you would teach us, Lord God. We pray for your help, Lord Jesus. Amen. So if you would, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 6, verse 39, or you can read it here on the screen uh, with me together. So Jesus is teaching, this is called, uh, in Luke's gospel, it's often referred to as the Sermon on the Plain or the Sermon on the Flat Spot. Um, it's funny, in Matthew's gospel, it says he went up on a mountain, and Jesus, or in Luke's gospel, it says he came down, which I'm thinking probably came down to a flat spot, but still on a mountain. And he's teaching very, this is a very similar sermon. And so this is, we're in the middle of it, for those of you who are catching up with us. So let me just read this text. Jesus says, I said, he also, Jesus, told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like the teacher. Jesus is teaching on discipleship here. Now, this is a key topic for me, discipleship. It's a growing concern of mine that we need to take back the biblical understanding of what it means to be a disciple. Now, for various reasons, uh, the church and even our culture um, have got caught up in misunderstanding or even misrepresenting discipleship. Sometimes it's portrayed as an as a extra credit if you'd like to do that or, or something that you don't necessarily have to do or maybe even something that you're not qualified to do. None of those are true. As you read scripture, we are all meant to be disciples of Jesus. I think one of the things that's also troubling is that sometimes it can be portrayed that Sunday morning, just gathering here for worship, is the only thing you have to do and you'll become a disciple. Now it's true, you will grow slowly, but you will grow, but we are meant for so much more. Now, it's hard because Sunday can become the main focus, um, and not only that, but as church leaders, we can even communicate to people that that's the most important thing to do. Um, but Sunday morning alone isn't enough. And I want to clarify that. I mean, I'm not saying that you have to come on Sunday and then do extra things to earn your way. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying that to become a disciple, gathering on Sunday morning for worship is a good start, but we are meant for more. We are meant to grow more deeply and more fully like Jesus and Sunday mornings are a good start, but we are meant for more. Now, in the early church, Sunday uh, was an important but small part of their worship, or of their faith. 
Now, they would gather throughout the week. They would gather for meals. They would gather together to study and to pray. They would gather together to hear uh, like small groups, similar to a small group that we have today. Um, the Lord's Day, or Sunday, was a time of gathering with the whole church, oftentimes in a large house, but gathering together with the whole church for things like communion, praying together, maybe hearing a sermon, but praising God was the central thing. And they would focus more on praise, worship, than trying to pack in the discipleship component as well. Now, fast forward to our day, and Sunday worship has become the main event in most Christian circles. It's the thing that gets portrayed to the church as, this is the big deal. Just make sure you come on Sunday, and that's enough. Now, it's enough in the sense that you don't have to do more to earn your way, but it's not enough for us to grow faithfully as disciples of Jesus. We need more. We're meant for more. So, and I think about this, that, that Sunday mornings, is, it's difficult to try and cram everything in the Christian life into an hour or an hour and a half. It was never the intent. In fact, it just won't happen. We will grow slowly, very slowly, maybe not even much at all, if we rely solely on Sunday morning gatherings to grow as disciples. We are meant for more. Okay, I was going to think about this. I was thinking about this week and using something like a meal metaphor. Probably not surprising to some of you. I think about food, right? Um, I was thinking about the meal portion. The meal is the personal devotion. That's that's the nutrients, that's the main thing, that's the main course is our daily walk, our daily connection with God. Whether that's praying and or studying scripture, even fasting, things that we do on a daily basis to stay connected to Jesus. That's the main course, that's where we get most of our nutrients, most of our nourishment. Then I was thinking about small groups being something like the cake, you know, the main part of the dessert at the end. So the, you can think about it. The main part is, is uh, personal devotion. Then after that, you get the cake. And that's gathering in a small group. And the small group uh, includes things like fellowship, where you're talking with each other, encouraging each other, praying for one another. And talk, it's also a great place to study scripture together in smaller groups where you can ask questions, you can uh, talk about things more deeply. They're great for that. And not only that, it also leverages those relationships that we form in a small group the trust that we build up, to be a place where people can encourage us, even correct us if we're starting to get off course. It's a place where we can grow as disciples in, in, in a faster way. Then I was thinking about the cake, so that's the cake is small groups. I was thinking about this moment here, Sunday mornings, as that thin layer of icing on the cake to kind of put it in perspective. You know, it's important for us to be here. Please don't hear me say that Sunday mornings are important. That's not at all what I mean. What I'm trying to say is, is that this moment here was not meant to bear us becoming fully formed followers of Jesus. It's a good place, and we should be here, but we are meant for more. It's like the icing on the cake. It's great. We come here, we praise God. You can sit and listen, and you can join in with others praying, and there's fellowship afterward. It's, very, it's like the sweet part of the cake but it's not very nourishing, or it's not as nourishing as, say, like the full meal when we do our daily devotions or gather in small groups. We grow as disciples better uh, on in personally in devotion and in small groups. All right, so we need to reorient and reprioritize our view of discipleship, focusing again on personal devotion. That's a great way to spend time with Jesus, and I think, you know, some of you might be asking, even I was asking this question this week, you know, how do we spend time with Jesus? What does that look like? Well, first of all, God's spirit dwells in us. The Holy Spirit, the moment we begin following Jesus and have, have begun following him, God's spirit dwells in us. So God is with us, whether we are fully aware of it or not. But we also spend time, or at least I find one of the best ways to spend time with Jesus, to see how he acts and what he says is by reading the Gospels to see how he interacts with people, to watch him heal people, reading the Gospels over and over to watch Jesus, to spend time with him. The other thing um, that we can do uh, to reorient and reprioritize is to get connected, if you're not already, with a small group. 
whether that's a group of uh, three or four of you or eight to 12 of you, getting together in a small group to pray together, to study God's word, to encourage one another, to share meals together. This is another way of growing uh, as a disciple. So Sunday morning, we're meant for more than just Sunday morning. The other thing I'm realizing is that we are all disciples of someone or something. And this is getting to the, the crux of this message. Remember Jesus said, can the blind lead the blind? Won't they all fall into a pit? And the point he's making is we need to be really careful about who we're following. And I don't know if you've heard this, but I've heard a few teachers that I respect say that we are all following someone, whether we realize it or not. We are all following someone. We are disciples of someone or something. Many or most of you in this room have made a choice to follow Jesus. You'll say, I am, I am intentionally following Jesus. But we also have to ask ourselves, are there times when I am following Jesus plus our culture or Jesus plus another teacher? We have to keep asking ourselves, are we following him? So, um, the thing I want to talk about here is that um, ask ourselves this question, who are we following? We learn in life that there are just so many options of ways to learn. You know, we can learn from teachers, like in a classroom setting. We can learn from lectures, if you've ever sat in a college lecture, or even a, a, a webinar or something like that, where lots of, being people, lots of people are being taught by one person, where they speak and you mainly just listen. We can learn from books. I've done a lot of learning from books. Uh, I can learn from YouTube. I feel like I fix most of my house with the help of YouTube these days, or mess it up worse and then have to call some the professional. Um, videos, we learn uh, things. And even there are a few people who learn from apprenticeships, but it's a very small number in our culture these days. Think about, I was thinking, Dave, about you this week and how many people you have apprenticed as a carpenter and others of you who have worked in trades, how you apprentice people. You show them, they work next to you for a while to learn not only the technique and the information, but how to do it. But that is less and less common in our culture. But in the ancient world, apprenticeship was the main way that you learned. Uh, you learned because books and, I mean, you could sit in lectures or talks, but the main way that you learned was by apprenticing with someone. You would follow them. You would follow them for, for months or years even, not only learning the information, but learning how to apply it. It also led to this humble dependence you can see when you are doing everything on your own, getting your own learning, you can start to think that I've kind of done this on my own. But when you follow a mentor, all those illusions uh, get washed away. And you realize that you are following someone. So when you're an apprentice, it's much easier. Humble humility is more, uh, happens more easily as an apprentice. You knew your place, especially when you began, and you knew that you depended on them. Not like now where uh, learners in our culture can be proud, even independent. Um, we can learn by books. We can learn by YouTube, as I mentioned. Mass instruction like a lecture hall. All of these ways are primarily learning on your own. You might sit in a room with lots of people, but you're not talking with them. They're not influencing you. You're just gathering information. The trouble is it can become easy to become a master in your own eyes where you think, I know so much even though you may not have wisdom or how to apply the information. So, um, as Christians, we need to apprentice with good teachers. We need to ask ourselves, who are we following, and then make a point to follow or apprentice with good teachers. Now, I was thinking about different teachers we have right now. One of the teachers that maybe, you'd not think, maybe you don't think of necessarily or right off the top would be our culture is a teacher, and it is teaching us all of the time. We are immersed in it. It's the air we breathe, the culture around us. And so it's really hard to point out when things are, you think like, wow, why do we do that? Or that doesn't seem right to me. It's harder to do that because everyone is doing it. It's not until if you ever go to a foreign country, we have foreign students who stay with us, and they come here to Canada, and they look at us sometimes, and they think, wow, why do you guys do that? Uh, for example, we had a Vietnamese student stay with us, and he would watch my boys eat, and I think he was appalled 
<laughs> my kids are like, you know, like shoveling food in their mouth, and, and he's eating with chopsticks and one bite at a time, and it took him like an hour to eat. But he was clean when he was done, and <laughs> you didn't have to get the vacuum under his chair. <laughs> When you're, in, when you're immersed in a culture, like Tracy and I, we don't notice it so much anymore. Even though we've talked with our boys, like, boys, slow down. Like, one day you're going to want to have a conversation with a girl, and you're not going to want this, you're not wanting to be embarrassed by how you eat. So, living in our culture can be difficult to pick it out. Things in our culture that are pretty prevalent, greed, materialism, focus on stuff, self-interest, we live in a very individualist society where people's first thought is what's best for me, not usually at least, not usually what is best for the group. Most people are asking in our culture, we're conditioned to think like what's best for me first. Another huge thing in our culture is consumerism. We have been trained, many of us from the time we were born to view life as everything as an, as an exchange Everything is an opportunity to buy and sell. Everything, I'm evaluating how useful it is to me and then what do I want to trade for it. That is deeply ingrained in us. I mean, from the time, I mean, I think about when I was a kid and I would watch cartoons and then the commercials would come on. Things I never knew I needed and then I'd watch the commercial and I'd go to my mom and things I couldn't live without now. That's our culture. Things like individualism, I talked about that, which even can lead to arrogance where we think like we know it all or that we have the answers to everything. So we have to be really careful that we are not just um, unquestionably taking cues from the culture around us. Not only that, but then we have mentors, and this is maybe a little bit more obvious, there's people who teach us that aren't Christians. Think about maybe like in business or in life, people who you've looked up to, who've taught you things, who, who weren't Christians, who weren't following Jesus. And I've seen, I mean, I have people like that in my own life, and some of them are really good, uh, some of them are really bad, things that, that they have determined to work for them in their life, and then I think about it later through a Christian lens, and I'm thinking like, wow, that's actually not very moral, and not very ethical, but it's what they've taught. So we have to be really careful with who we follow. Now, I also want to say that like, now we start talking about inside the church, inside faith, and we start f picking people or looking at people that we want to, f to follow or to mentor with. Now, we have to be careful here as well um, because there are still even blind leaders, even in the church, people who think they know but are still misleading. And we have to be careful. I mean, Paul talked about this in the church in Corinth. He was talking with the, the church there saying, be careful who you're following. Some of you have become arrogant in your faith and you are wrong. You have been misled. You're following a blind teacher. So he's saying, come back and get back close to Jesus. So the best teacher for us, the best teacher um, would be Jesus himself. For us to spend time reading scripture, for us to spend time praying, watching how Jesus lived and interacted with people to spend time with him personally. But short of that, we can also spend time with faithful people in our church, and there are a few, <laughs> more than a few in this church, and I'm grateful for that. People that we can spend time with who will not only teach us how to act, but they keep pointing us back to Jesus. That they will say, you know what? I mess up. They will speak honestly with us, and they'll say, yeah, I blew it there, or in my life, I blew it in that moment and I wish I'd done it differently, don't do what I did, but follow Jesus, stay close to him, and you will avoid the mistakes I make. So we want to be very careful and thoughtful with who we follow. We need to make a conscious choice about who we're going to follow. Now in our church, I'm less concerned about us choosing a false teacher. As I look out at you, there's none of you where I'm thinking like, boy, I sure hope they make a good choice. What I'm actually more concerned about for you and for me is that we are trying to follow Jesus plus other teachers. We're trying to follow him and squeeze a few other things in next to it as well. Now, some of us are following our culture pretty closely and we're trying to figure out how can we fit Christianity in the edges? Is there a way I can fit my Christian conviction in? 
Some of you are, some of us are on the other side where we're deeply devoted to Jesus, but we're trying to figure out how can I fit 21st century culture in? How can I be a follower of Jesus and still have all the things that I dream of? We have to be careful of this. We have to continually recognize false teachers and reorient our lives back towards Jesus. We need to recalibrate often. And thankful Tracy is not here. She's visiting her family down in the States. Uh, she testified to how often, like, if you've ever had navigation or like on your phone or even in your car and you make a wrong turn, it will say recalibrating, like you're lost. Let me figure out how to get you back on track. Um, how often that happens to me. Not only when I'm trying to drive through some unknown city, but also in life and faith. That we have to regularly recalibrate. Look at our lives, look at who we've been following as teachers, and ask ourselves, am I following Jesus plus others that have gotten me off track? So, we need to recalibrate. Now, God has been, just to give you an example of this recalibration, God has been working recalibration in me. And I feel like he's been working at it for years. (laughs) And I'm still... I still don't have it. I'm still not good at it, but one of them is generosity and sharing. I don't know if I was born this way or if it's what happened, but generosity is not easy for me. I was thinking about it. This, I was talking with some friends. Uh, we had some friends who were um, going to do something, and, and, and they were not sure how they were going to do it, and Tracy just said, you guys should just use ours. And my first thought was like, what are you doing? That's mine. But she was right. And I've experienced some of you and your generosity with me or generosity that I've seen you share with others and I admire it so much. It's something that I'm working at. And so uh, our friends borrowed our thing and, and, I, and I honestly, I was like, I was lying through my teeth saying, oh, I hope you have a wonderful time. Let me get it all ready for you. Use it as much as you want, as long as you want. I'm lying through my teeth, honestly, but I need to grow. This is what I mean about recalibration because that is more how the world thinks, not how Christ thinks. So I say that to you, one, first of all, show you're not the only ones who, uh, maybe you, if you're feeling like you need some recalibration, join the club, but also to help us see that it's in all sorts of, all places of our life. So maybe you're here this morning and you're hearing this, and you're recognizing some places in your life you need to recalibrate this morning. Or maybe you need some time to think about it, but maybe you're realizing that you've drifted a bit off course from Jesus. Or maybe in the last year or months, you, you have to feel like you've lost touch with Jesus altogether. Or maybe you're hearing this for the first time, and you want to follow Jesus right now. You want to begin following him. Well, how do we do that? Because this is the thing, is that I want you to know that there is life more full waiting for you, that God loves you, that he is gracious and wants to help you recalibrate and come back to him, to leave the wrong direction you were headed and recalibrate and return to him. The thing is, all it takes this first step And it may feel, I know this is a thing where in our culture it will work against a bit. The best thing, the first step is to repent. And I know that in our culture around us, that word gets abused and it gets a bad connotation. But I'm thinking about repent in terms of the Hebrew word shuv, which means to turn around, which means if you're heading one direction, you turn 180 degrees and come back towards God. That we repent We say, Lord, please forgive me for this place where I've recognized I've gotten off course. I want to come back to you. And this is the thing. Because of his grace and how deeply he loves you, that's all it takes, and he welcomes you right back. In fact, helps you return through his spirit. So, we take that first step. We repent and return to him. Maybe some of you are thinking, like, I need to do this. Um, I need to return to him. Some of you might be thinking, I want to try this for the first time in my life. I want to begin following Jesus and and to devote my life to him, to get on track with him. It begins with repentance. It's simple, 
this simple turning away from the, from the wrong direction and begin following him, it's simple, but it changes your life. It gives you life, not only life more full, not more easy, but more full right now that begins and goes on forever with him. So the next question you might be asking is, okay, how do I do this, Jason? We've talked about recalibrating. What do we do? The first thing, and I just talked about it, was repent. Turn 180 degrees, leave the wrong direction, and begin following him. Leave blind teachers, whether it's culture or someone else that you've been listening to, a podcast, something that you realize, you know, it's not really helping me follow Jesus. In fact, it's leading me away. Turn away from that stuff. Ask for forgiveness. In humility, come to God. Then begin following Jesus. And we have already talked about this. It's not too complicated. First is um, gather here on Sundays for worship to be connected with other Christians but don't rely on this, okay? This isn't going to get you very far very fast. You need more than just gathering on Sundays if you want to grow as a disciple of Jesus. When you do that, gather on Sundays. Yes, please do that, but also get connected to a small group. Whether it's a group of eight to 12 people, that's good. It's a little bit harder to get deeper into conversations because there's so many people. It's a little bit easier to hide or, or maybe uh, focuses more on one person. I I found in my life one of the ideal is to be grouped in like a group of three or four people because you have deep, intense conversations, meaningful conversations all the time. Um, So stay, so gather together in a small group because small groups can become a, a launching place where you gather in a small group. If you gather for Sundays, you might go a month before someone asks you, how are you really doing? In a small group, that happens way more regularly. And from there, someone can say, hey, let's go out to coffee. Let's go get lunch and let's talk some more about this. That's another way that we grow more as disciples. The the next step, and this is the most important one, this is the meal, is that we gather, or sorry, not gather, but we, well, yeah, gather together with Jesus for personal devotion. Or we spend time with him, whether that's prayer, reading the Bible in the morning. I find I do it in the morning because then I'm sure that it gets done. Or, or fasting, or serving others. There are things that we do that help us connect to Jesus. Do those things on a daily basis. I want to say this, that discipleship is not a status that we reach, but a process that we're in. You never finish growing as a disciple. You continue growing until you stand in front of Jesus. So none of us are done yet. We all have more to go. Because becoming like Jesus is the goal. And there is no way to fully achieve that this side of heaven. So we continually need to recognize when we are off course, we need to reorient ourselves. We need to recognize that we are off course and recalibrate and begin following Jesus again. Bless you this week. As you do that work, as you begin asking, Lord, where am I off track? I want to follow you again. I want to come back to you. Bless you as you begin following him and bless you as you grow as disciples. Amen.